December seminary class. Hope everyone had a good lunch and a nice rest. So let's open the class with um, the Shanti Mantra, which some of you may know. If you don't know it, just close your eyes and listen. Om 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 On your agenda, there's a little Christian song which will only take a minute, <clears throat> and it does come from the New Testament. Um, I think. Uh, I'm not sure where. I forgot. I knew at one point. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So it goes like this: Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice, 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 and again I say rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. This um, little song is usually sung in rounds. Do you know what that is? <coughs> It takes yes. a little practice. Row, row, row. <laughs> it's like row, row, row your boat, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> before I turn the program over to Dr. John Mundy, I want to talk a little bit about um, the announcements here. Uh, final exams. Your class president, <clears throat> Rob Severson, uh, has formulated the study groups for the final exam and hopefully he has sent you an electronic copy of them. Yes? Yeah. No. Yeah. He sent us the team. Is that what you remember? Yeah. He didn't send you a copy of the final exam? No. Yeah, not copy. Uh, I don't think he sent the exam itself yet. Oh, okay. Just the um... All right. Well, you will get it. Um, he has it. <clears throat> Next month, I will give you a hard copy. And the hard copy that I'm giving you is slightly different but it's basically saying the same thing, okay? And do you understand how the study groups work, or should I review it? Review it. Review it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> each study group will have a captain, and the study groups will take the final exam and break it up into parts. So let's say Susan's group, let's say you're gonna do pages one and two, okay? So you do the pages one and two, answer all the questions, and when you're finished, you send it to your captain. If you're the captain, then you just keep it and receive the answers from the rest of your study group. Once the captain receives all the answers for the final exam, the captain will then send it to Rob. Okay, he's <laughs> gonna post those answers on the Yahoo site. Each group's answers will then get posted on the Yahoo site. So you can now study not only your own answers, but everybody else's, or read them. So it's a, it's a style of cooperative learning, okay? You don't have to study everyone else's answers. You may just want to study your own group's answers. That's your choice, but it's available. If you want to read to see, well, how, uh, how did other people answer that question, okay? And um, so you'll have from now <clears throat> until June to work on the final exam. He will give you a deadline as to when your answers are due, the written answers. Okay? It should probably be sometime in April, maybe mid-April. 
So if you're each only doing two pages, it's not, you know, critical. You know, I mean, you'll have plenty of time. Um, you'll have plenty of time, but there's an awful lot of other things as well that are due. Mm -hmm. I remember you saying that last year at my experience. It was, it was exciting, but do pay attention. Do. It takes time. I did send all of you a letter in December, okay? And if you remember the letter, I did talk a little bit about Christianity. It was no. a one-page oh, no. letter. Mm -hmm. I see, everyone got it. Email. Oh, email. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I did talk a little bit about Christianity, and I did also mentioned the assignments. If any of you are behind in any of your assignments, I highly recommend that you catch up as quickly as possible before February. In February, there will be one additional assignment, and that will be to design or create a funeral service from beginning to end. From the time you get that first phone call, what do you ask, what do you say, okay, to the time when you're either <clears throat> in a church or you're at the graveside or however you're going to design your funeral service. In March, you will be asked to create a wedding service. And again, written down, it should be from the first time you get that phone call. You know, when the bride and the groom call you and they want you to do their wedding ceremony, what do you say? What do you ask? And that is really, really important. I highly recommend that you get a brand new notebook and you call it your wedding notebook and put the questions in there, because you'll need them. If people call you, you really need to know what to say and be prepared. Um, because, you know, if you want, you want the job, you know, they'll, they'll hear it in your voice if you're unsure of yourself. So <clears throat> it's really recommended that you create a wedding notebook or create a wedding file, and uh, you could, it starts here. And you'll use whatever information that you research now, you will use it. And we'll talk about weddings. You'll, you'll also January. have a presentation here yeah. on weddings and funerals and baptism. So, because yeah. of those additional assignments, I highly recommend that you catch up. And there are books for the funeral and for the wedding on the bibliography. You might want to get the, the one of our speaker, uh, Maureen. Uh, what's what, January she's coming? Mm -hmm. January. Uh, she is coming. She's I, coming. Last year she did bring some books to sell. She'll bring her own. She, she's written a book called I Can, I Will, I, can, I, I Will, I Do. Yeah, I just yeah. sent it out it's, actually because the uh, the class that had the Baha'i speaker yes, last semester mm -hmm. contained oh. the same class. She was in the afternoon. Okay. And I, okay. I told people, you know, if you just want to listen to the Baha'i part, that's fine, but I'm sending the whole class. If you want the handouts from the speaker about weddings, let me know. And I got a fairly overwhelming response. Most people okay. wanted it. So I said, okay, and I well, sent it, it to the Yahoo group. Yeah. You know, so they all have the notes and the name of the book on the Amazon. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so... There's also all the information that you need is on that website, including the um, assignment sheets that you need on the Yahoo. On the Yahoo. Um, there's really a tremendous amount of information on that. And if you're having trouble, as, you, as uh, Kathleen said last month, call I guess Bud. Yeah, is call or person. email. Send an email Bud to James. him and ask him for help. Because really everything that you need is on that. And <clears throat> please remember when you're sending the assignments in to use the cover sheet, because this is really an important thing for us to keep so we know what you've done, what you haven't done. And please put your name on every paper. For example, here's a paper right here that somebody worked really hard on and it's 
you know, several pages long. Single space. There's no identification. No. We don't know who it belongs to. You know, it, if it gets mixed up, with, you know, there's a lot of papers that come in each month. So without a cover sheet and with no identification, I have no idea Does who it belongs to. Does it have a title? To. No. <clears throat> No, it doesn't. You really, you know, Simply, if you, you know how to cut and paste. If you just, you know, type out your name and the paper it is, you can just cut, you know, just copy and paste on each sheet. You know, it's, it's. I, I just, because I got my papers back and, and I put a header with my name mm -hmm. and some pages it printed it out, but some it didn't. So those pages don't have my name on it, although I had it in the file. So maybe also when you print it out, mm -hmm. you know, that something could get lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some information. And also the format is totally different, you know, so maybe that's also a reason. And your ink is blue? No, no, but see, I got all my papers back and, and there the header so was not printed mm -hmm. out, but on the other papers, the header was printed out and my name is in the header. I understand. So, so maybe but, but even so, you got blueprint, right? Yes, I put it in blueprint. Who was this blueprint? submitted as hard copy or <laughs> by <blueprint>. email? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't <laughs> remember. Um, why don't you read like the first couple of sentences? Yeah, if you read the first line, well, we'll put it out there. Well, this one was probably September because it says Ram Das and Gorman have written a dialogue about conscious service. And it says in chapter one they blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So this is about this must have been from September. Mm -hmm. and you put and, a page uh, on the internet on the Yahoo site, and then they, anybody can look at it. <laughs> I think the first few lines might the be enough. The first page. Well, it's easy well, to do the first page you know, and the first few lines, isn't it? Um, this one says the title of this book suggests a boring anthology of facts and figures. Uh, Houston. So I guess it's about Houston. Right. <laughs> So, you know, all I could say is please be mindful of that, that, you know, a lot of papers come in like every month, like a stack like this, and if it loses its place in the pile and it needs to get back to you or me, if there's no identification. I think you need to know. Okay. The other thing is, is that I have said, I've made a few comments in some of the papers that I've read about this would be a great paper to share with their fellow students. Um, I think we can do that also. There was some talk yeah. about being able to do that on the Yahoo website. Yes, if you have a paper that you think would be beneficial for the rest of the class to read, which a lot of them would be, send it to Rob or send it to uh, Bud and they will post it on that Yahoo site. It's an excellent point. Is that yeah. what, could you do that with that? Yeah, I, I can do that. I can scan it in. Okay. I saw that and uh, again, if you don't have a cover, somebody mentioned they didn't have a cover sheet. It was emailed to you if you need another one. Uh, it's I'll also do that. on the, web, the Yahoo website. It's on the Yahoo website, right. Everything is listed there. Okay, um, let's see. <clears throat> Your thesis is due in June. Okay, the thesis is a 25 page paper that should be uh, about your future ministry. And if you're unsure about what you'd like to write about, you can call me, you can call Emily, you can call John and talk it over and we'll guide you. Describe what your ministry would be if there were no obstacles. In your wildest dreams, with no obstacles, you have all the funding, all the support, no obstacles. What would it look like? What would it be? Where will it be? You know, complete detail. Who will be there? What guest speakers, et cetera, et cetera. You can have it televised. You can do have a radio program. I mean, whatever you in your wildest dreams, okay? Yeah. So that's what your paper is. Remember the academy last year with David mm -hmm. Zimmerman? He was contacting Donald Trump to donate a building. <laughs> you know, well, he needed a big building in Manhattan. And he's a big guy. Yeah. So. Okay. Any questions about assignments? 
before we move on. Is everyone clear about the eight assignments every month? We, I know we went over it in October, bit by bit, and I did I send another. Have this. You all have this. Yes. Will we be getting an MP3 or DVD of, about funerals before our assignment is due? Some examples? The Did one from something? last June. Yeah. It was about, well, it was more about death and dying. There, we did talk about funeral <sighs> development, remember, last year? I don't know which one it is. I think we talked about that. But you know who got it? That one student that wanted an audit and he never wrote back. Maybe we can work the funeral thing in. Okay. Could you do that, Larry? Could you say I'll look for whatever I have in the MP3 I that I can always send. Okay. All right. Let's Thank do you. that. Okay, in the afternoon okay. before Maureen or? All right. Okay. Well, maybe we'll take a shorter lunch some, break. I sometimes next. confuse those two. Weddings and funerals. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll take a shorter lunch break next <laughs> month. This week. So we can <laughs> review that. But there is an MP3 <laughs> of funeral development from last year. I don't remember which from month last we did year. it. Yes. There was a garbled the one, one with before. Rabbi Gelberman that, that the sound is really bad. No. No, we'll do it. But then there was the one from June that was really talking more about hospice and right. no, people dying. It wasn't one. about funerals. No. We, we talked yeah. about it. And there was all, in your class, we it. also talked about it. It was one of maybe December or January of that year. Because John was there for that, okay. I remember. It was look a segment. Look at January, yeah, yeah just a I segment. Can, I can look for the word funeral. Okay. If you find it, just send that out to them. So they'll have that. But, you know, do your own research. The internet is a wealth of knowledge, you know. And there's, you know, you can, you can figure it out. And there's a lot of information on weddings, wedding ceremony development, lots. Uh, okay, so and tuition, most of you are paying, you know, on time, and um, just remember that we need all the tuition paid in full by May, okay, as early as possible in May. If you have a problem, let me know, and we'll work work on it. But all the tuition has to be <coughs> done by May. I need all the bookkeeping finished. Okay, now all of you are. I've received a gift from Bud James, your colleague. Mm -hmm. So I'll read you uh, his note. It says, Merry Christmas. Please give one to each student in attendance. I will mail one to all that are not there on 12-8. Uh, the rest, please give to the staff. Much love, Bud. Mm -hmm. So, now I'm going to turn the program, oh, maybe I should show that calendar so everyone can see okay. it. Okay, a couple is, of picture pages. Yeah, this is beautiful. Okay, it says, a calendar filled with miracles and offering love or asking for love. The correct response in all circumstances is love. And he's done a really beautiful job. January and each month has <clears throat> something to say from the Course in Miracles book. And then what, really the, nice. what the religious holidays are down below. Are listed. Are all listed. Oh yeah, that's wonderful. And the numbers should correspond with the dates. Right. No, the work it's well thought out. out. What would Assuming that you started the Miracles on January. Oh, oh, all right. That's what okay. the All right. All right. Got it. So, thank you, Bud. Thank you, Bud. Yeah. Okay, John, you're on. Okay, thank you. So, this afternoon, we're going to return to A Course in Miracles, <coughs> um, modern spiritual classic. And uh, unlike this morning, which was sort of a difficult topic to talk about uh, the sad process that the church has gone through, this is good, good news and a good topic. I know that, that many of you already have been our, our students of the course, 
I mean, is everybody here, is there anyone who's not been a student of the course? Not finished? No, not been, no, not, no, we never finished. <laughs> who has not been a student at one point or another? Exactly. Done the workbook and other yeah. I mean, there's one. There's a group of people who just read the net and a smaller so, correspondence. All right, three correspondents are not. Okay, so the rest are. Okay, well, good. I know many of you are here actually because of the course. All right. I like to um, start with a little yeah. story. You don't have to be. <laughs> I just wanted to get a feel for it. But you better be. I mean, you better be. Pardon me. There's a story about a soldier who's walking around in an army camp barracks. He goes over, he picks up a piece of paper. He looks at it, he says, that's not it. He throws it down. He walks around, he picks up another piece of paper. He looks at it and he says, that's not it. He throws it down. Keeps doing this. The supervising officer is watching him. The size of this guy is probably deranged. He sends him off to the army psychologist for an examination. He examines him. He decides, indeed, this guy is deranged. So he writes out a letter of dismissal from the army. He gives it to the guy, <laughs> he takes the letter, he looks at it and he says, Oh, this is it! <laughs> <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Can you hold this? Sure. Alright, so this is a course in miracles. First line, it's a required course. So we're going to go line by line now. <laughs> What the course means when it says it's a required course is that at one point or another, each and every one of us on a soul level, spiritually speaking, are going to go through the same kind of a process that the course is describing. And now, what I love about the course, and I'm sure that you do too, is the course is of itself, and this is very interfaith. This is a way. It's not the way. It says there are many thousands of pathways back to God again. And actually, if you think about it, there are billions. Because there are many pathways as there are people on this planet. We're really all looking to get back to God again. This just happens to be a way that works. That is psychologically very sophisticated. It is really a document of the 20th and the 21st century. Let me just share with you a little bit about how it came into existence. A little bit of how I came to be involved with it, and we'll get into what it says. It was scribed. It was written down by a woman named Dr. Helen Schuchman, who was a research psychologist and professor at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons here in New York City happened in conjunction with her boss, his name is Dr. William Thetford, who was head of the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. So this is a very prestigious organization, beginning in 1965 up through 1972. Now one of the things that's interesting about being where we are right now, I, get, I travel all over not only the United States, but quite a bit of other countries, talking about the course. And where we're sitting right now <laughs> is about as close as you can sit, in some ways, I mean, it, and study it, to where it was written. Because Helen lived on East 17th Street. So where this is East 13th Street up here, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just another four more blocks to where most of this was composed, and it happens to be this this block, no, no, it's not mm -hmm. west, but east, so it was composed right here. Um, the way it happened was, first of all, there's a, Bill and Helen, as I said, were professors at Columbia. They were very competitive. There were a lot of ego game stuff going on. 
not just between the two of them, but with other colleagues at Columbia. A lot of fighting, backbiting, one chip game playing, who could write the most learned papers, etc. One day Bill turned on Helen and said to her, there's got to be another way. Meaning, there has to be some way that the two of us, and not just the two of us, but all of us who are part of this department, <clears throat> this is the psychology department, right? Can't get along with each other. And very uncharacteristic of herself, and, and I knew Helen, so I know it was uncharacteristic of her. She turned back to Bill and she said, you're right. I'll help you find it. And they always thought that the course was the answer to that other way. A little bit about Helen's background. Helen grew up in a family here in New York City. Her father was half Jewish, half Lutheran, preferred to think of himself as being a militant atheist, which is kind of interesting because if you're a militant atheist, that means you've got some relationship going on with God. Her mother looked into theosophy, religious science, unity, Christian science, was probably affected more by Christian science than anything else, but never adopted any particular religious persuasion. She was also raised in part by a black Baptist cook and a Catholic nanny, both of whom introduced her to their religions. Helen liked the black Baptists because of their enthusiasm, and she liked uh, the Catholic Church because of the devotion that she'd noticed on the part of priests and nuns to their professions. And I think she was also attracted to the ritual aspect of it. Although, when Helen was a little girl growing up here in New York City, she would go with her Catholic nanny to services, and seeing how she was Jewish, she was forbidden to go into the sanctuary. Uh, she would stay out in the vestibule and watch through the crack in between the doors. And so, you know, the great mystery about what's going on in there for a young girl, right? Mm -hmm. um, Helen carried rosary beads in her purse. One of the things that she liked to do after work would over, uh, she would often find a Catholic church and go in and sit. So, she never joined the Catholic Church, she never formally became a part of that, but there was a dimension to it which was appealing to her. She describes herself in the courts as being an atheist, and no doubt she was, especially as a young woman. But at the same time that that's true, she had a number of kind of psychic, quasi-mystical experiences. She was very subject, for example, to visionary experiences. <clears throat> There's a, a story about when she was a young girl and her family was in Europe. And I, they were, I, I think, at Lourdes of all places, and they were staying in a hotel or something. And <clears throat> she was trying to decide if she believed in God. And she went and she stood on the balcony. and. She closed her eyes and she said that she would believe in God if when she opened her eyes she would see a shooting star. Mm -hmm. And she closed her eyes and she opened her eyes and she did not see a shooting star. Mm -hmm. She saw a meteorite shout. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what she asked for. She asked for a meteorite. <laughs> so it wasn't good enough. <laughs> Um, briefly, how I came to know Helen and Bill. Um, before the course was completed, they spent some time looking into things which had come in a similar way to the course, like the Edgar Casey material and the Seth material, etc. Let me add that Helen really did not think of herself as being the author of this, and, and I know she wasn't. You, you can tell it. Even she might have been a genius, but she didn't. She didn't write this. It's way, way, way. It's not her language. It's way too beautiful. I, I think it's interesting that uh, 
Mozart said he did not write his sonatas. I don't know whether you know the story of Ramanujan or not. He was a, uh, a, a English, not he, he was a Indian mathematician from the latter part of the 20th, early part of the 21st, of the 20th century. Latter part of the 19th, early part of the 20th. Very short life. He died when he was in his 30s. <coughs> Um, he came up with a number of theorems, math mathematical theorems, 3,900 theorems. Uh, he sent them off to some professors at Oxford University. One of them poo pooed it, two of them poo pooed it, the third one said no, he thought there was something to it. They brought him to Oxford. They were looking to make him a fellow at Oxford, but he couldn't pass courses in sociology and history because he could only think in math. Mm. His mind with mathematical, it's just like Mozart thought in music, Ramanujan thought in math. He could write down, the, but he said he did not, these, these were given to him, these theorems. And most of them have never been disproven. Uh, a lot of them, as it turned out, have to do with subatomic physics, and of course there was no such thing as subatomic physics. Uh, during the early part of the 20th century. This is pre-Einstein, so, or when Einstein himself was still working on this kind of stuff, right? Um, and, and so I think it was interesting, uh, if any of you heard Jonathan Livingston Seagull by uh, uh, Richard Bach, Bach right, yeah. Richard Bach? Well, Richard Bach said he did not write Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Hmm. It was given to him. But I reread it recently, just in September, and uh, it is filled with descriptions of very intricate uh, aerobotic moves in the airplane. And Richard Bach was a stunt pilot, <laughs> right? Who would know how to describe really intricate twists and turns and, and moves, right? So he knew the language, just like Ramanujan knew the language of math and Marta and Well, Helen knew psychology. So there's a lot of psychology in there, especially for already in psychology. <clears throat> I once asked Ken Wapnick why he thought that the course came into existence now. He said he didn't know for sure, but he was sure that it couldn't have come till after Freud. Uh, because it wasn't until Freud that we had a real clear ego psychology. He described to us how this thing works, this thing called an ego. He told us about ego defense mechanisms, he told us about repression and Nile and how all those functions work. We talk about the importance of dreams, of course, talks a great deal about the importance of dreams as revelations to looking into the depths of our psyche. So the way I came to it was that in 1973, the course was finished in 72, it wasn't published till 76, but in 73, um, I attended a conference for, with an organization named Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship. Um, Helen and Bill came to that conference. I gave a lecture at that conference on mysticism. I had a book came out that year called Learning to Die. And they came to my talk. I, I, I think to this day about who was sitting there listening to my talk. If, if I had known, I mean, I was 30 years old. And I, I think I thought I knew something, you know, I was kind of a cocky <laughs> PhD student, you know, like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and here were people who really did know something, you know, so, but they were very nice to me. Uh, so I was introduced to the two of them that, that after the lecture. Uh, they didn't say anything about A Course in America, because they did say that Helen had written like this uh, spiritual book. And I actually remember looking at Helen. Helen was a short little woman with frizzy hair and big glasses. And I remember looking at her and thinking, isn't that sweet that a little old lady wrote an inspirational book? <laughs> <laughs> Probably got some nice prayers in it. It, it does. <laughs> it has some very nice prayers in it. So the next year, 74, I wrote a letter, was published in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology expressing interest in being in contact with anybody who was working in the fields of psychotherapy and spirituality, because I was doing a dissertation on that at the time. Uh, Bill saw my letter, told <laughs> Helen, 
he felt it was a call for her to complete the writing of the psychotherapy pamphlet. You may know that there's two books that came as the same, from the same source of the course. One's called Psychotherapy, Purpose, Process, Practice, and the other's called A Song of Prayer. Helen had taken down the first 13 pages of the psychotherapy pamphlet, but she had never finished it. So she finished it in April 75, called me and said, I have something for you. I didn't know what she was talking about, but it seemed important. I was living inside of General Theological Seminary at the time, which is on West 19th Street, between 19th and 20th. Uh, and uh, so I walked over here that evening. It was a Sunday evening. Sat on, and this was meeting was in Ken Wapnick's uh, little studio apartment on 17th Street. Helen sat on Ken's daybed, told me about the course, how it came into existence, how it affected them, and gave me a copy of the psychotherapy pamphlet. And I remember walking home that evening thinking the most important thing which had ever happened to me had just happened, but I didn't know what it was. And it was a good year and a half before I began to understand what the Course was saying. Um, about six weeks after that, Helen met Judy Scutch. Now, Judy Scutch was very active in the parapsychological movement here in New York. We were both members of the American Association of Parapsychology. Uh, we uh, both were teaching at, at NYU at the time, courses in psychology. I was teaching humanistic psychology. She was teaching parapsychology classes. Uh, it was a very exciting time. This is the 70s, early, early 70s. A lot of things were, you know, changing. The Vietnam War was coming to an end. Uh, it was a wonderful place to Greenwich Village during the 70s. And the courses I were teaching were at the New School were all on esoteric and mystical philosophy, so they were a bunch of students. When Judy got the course, she just took far with it. She just, this is like the thing she'd been looking for for all of her life. She saw to it that a bunch of copies were Xerox, so we started studying with Xerox copies. I didn't begin to understand it until July 76. Um, it was published on June 22, 1976. And I had a profound death experience in 76, in July 76, which I describe in my book, Missouri Mystic, which was really came as a part of a shamanic journey in the jungles in Chiapas in southern Mexico which really enabled me to understand some things that the Course was saying. The Course says some very unusual things, metaphysically speaking, that don't make sense on an ego level, don't, that don't make sense on an everyday worldly level, like there's no world, <laughs> uh, there's no time, you're not a body, uh, there's no heaven, I mean there's no hell, there's heaven, but it's not like what we think it is. It's not a place. It's not a part of their people. <laughs> you know, it says heaven is, is a it is it's a state of consciousness, really. It's it's a level of awareness uh, that we come to. It's it's an awareness that says a perfect oneness. The awareness of perfect oneness. Right? One of the pre reasons people have difficulty understanding the course. I think it's because the Course really draws a distinction between uh, the outer world and the inner world like nothing else can do, between physical and non-physical. And what it really is saying is what's real is invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, you really, we can't, what, what the body's eyes see are deceptive. There's actually a line in the Course where it says, there's nothing so deceptive as the perception of form. We tend to think that what we see is what's real. Just last night or night before last, night before last I watched uh, on TV uh, the Polar Express, which is being played mm -hmm. at every Christmas, right? So I watched it again, and there is this line in there. There's several wonderful lines in there. One of the lines is that Tom Hanks, who's the conductor on the train, and very much sort of plays this role of like the Holy Spirit. There's also another the hobo on top of the train. Mm -hmm. 
is very much the Holy Spirit, by the way. It, uh, he kind of disappears and disappears very, very easily, you know. The train runs into a, goes through a tunnel and <laughs> crashes and he just, he disappears. <laughs> but anyhow, there's this line where Tom Hanks <clears throat> uh, turns to the little boy who's like the boy hero in the, in this story and says, uh, what's most real is invisible to the eye, right? Which, Love is real, it's invisible to the eye. Mind is real, it's invisible to the eye. The things which are really real have nothing to do with the out. We live on the outside, we live in a world of form, we live in our bodies. As I said a moment ago, of course, it's, it's, you're not a body. In terms of the body is a very, very temporal experience. It really lasts for just a moment. Shakespeare's really got it right with out, out, brief, candle, life support player. That struts and frets its hour upon the stage, a tale told an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And it signifies nothing insofar as it's just a drama, it's a story, it's a soap opera, it's a dream. And the chorus is so very, very, very clear about the fact that this is a dream. Uh, and that we're not really awake. We may think of ourselves as being awake, but uh, we're not really awake. We're, of course, as your nighttime dream, your daytime dream, it has a different form. That's that's all. So when we're when we're dreaming at night, I think one of the most important lines in the course is uh, the first three words of chapter twenty-one. As the sentence appears twice in the course, three words: sense, projection, makes perception. It's so important to understand those three words. That is also the basic difference between mysticism and non-mystical states. The difference between a mystic and an ordinary person, an ordinary person being all of us, <laughs> almost all the time, is the mystic, rather than being a projector, <clears throat> excuse me, as a receptor, so they just see, but they see without commentary, without analysis, without interpretation. There's a line in the Course where it says, the ego analyzes, the Holy Spirit accepts. It's a very important line. And the ego analyzes the, hell of the, the basic problem we have, the basic addiction which everybody has, which is the addiction of the world, is judgment. We're addicted to our judgments. And we can't really stop it. You can stop it, but it's not easy to stop it. Something has to happen to cause it to stop. I mentioned this when I talked about mysticism as well, because if you can stop the projection, then what happens is that you just, you, you see. But now there's not, no longer an analysis of what, there's no good and bad. One of the most important things about the Course is the Course is a monistic system. Uh, traditional Christianity is dualistic. Uh, much of our religions are dualistic. Interestingly enough, the Course is very similar to the ancient uh, Vedanta system of Hinduism and to Buddhism. Uh, Bill Thetford, who was Helen's cohort in producing the Course, said at one point that the Course was the Christian Vedanta. And it really is the Christian Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta. Pardon? Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta. Yeah. It's, what it says is all there is, is God. All there is, is one. All there is, is truth. All there is, is love. It, there's just one thing. There's no such thing as dunus. <laughs> dunus doesn't exist. There's, to put it in mystical terms, there's no, there's no subject object. 
we can't have a subject and an object. There's just this, and that's actually what happens when we, when we fall in love. One of the things that happens is that we begin to experience the dissolving of boundary. So we, we tend to, there's this feeling of merging or blending or becoming one with the beloved. So we are, this, we are with, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. There's no separation. This all gets started, as you very well know, it's very clearly described in the mythology of the Adam and Eve story. It's interesting what happens there that, that it says that Adam's eyes are opened and he is able to distinguish between good and evil. What does he do? He eats of the knowledge of the fruit of good and evil. Which means that we now have two possibilities. We have good and evil. Of course, that's no. All we have is one thing. We just have God. We just have oneness. And anything that's outside of oneness would be an illusion. It's not real. It has. What makes it not real is that there's no eternity in it. There's no permanence in it. Again, this is the course distinguishes between time and eternity. Time being a part of the illusion, eternity being being the oneness again. We live in what I call the four great illusions. The course never says four great illusions. Well, I think there's four great illusions. The four great illusions are: a) you live in a body. You do not live in a body. The body is a dream character. It is a character in a dream. It looks very real, I know, but just keep in mind, at some point, you're going to let go of it because everybody does. There's, you know, nobody lives. I, I heard a couple months ago, the oldest woman in the world died. It sounds like the opening line to a joke. Uh, but she did. And uh, she was 132 years old. And she lived in Georgia, Russia. And I thought what was interesting about it is the next oldest woman in the world is 116. So they, she was 16 years older than the oldest living person, right? But, all right, so Hardy, the percentage of us that get past 100 is a very, very small percentage. And, and 100 is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, in relationship to infinity, it doesn't count. You know what I mean? It, does, it just doesn't even add up. It's, it's not even a number. Um, so what you are is your spirit. Spirit's really the preferred word that the Course uses. Occasionally uses the word soul, but doesn't use this. It says, if you understand soul and spirit to mean the same thing, then okay, but the reason we don't use the word soul is that soul is very easily misinterpreted to mean personality, as in sweet soul, good soul, sad soul, you know, qualities that we might put on to. Uh, you know, but it's not quite, spirit is more, is be, even beyond sad soul or. Well, usually it's old soul. Old soul, there you go, that's another, another way, to, another term we could use for it. Some sort of adjective that precedes soul, right? There's no adjective that precedes spirit in a sense. So, what's exciting about the Course is that it, it works. It consists of three books, so we've got a textbook, 669 pages that describes the philosophy. And it's beautiful. It is so beautifully written that sometimes you just want to cry when you're reading it. it, it much of it, especially part from chapter 5 on, is written in the iambic pentameter, where it's got this kind of beat to it, which is just beautiful. Sometimes it's very, very clear that Shakespeare was written in iambic pentameter. Uh, all of the text, all of the workbook is. The, so we got a textbook. Workbook of 365 lessons takes, there's one lesson a day, takes a minimum of a year to go through. You cannot go faster than one lesson a day. Slower, 
but not faster than one. That's the only one rule in the entire course. The only rule in the entire course is don't do more than one lesson a day. Okay. Then we got the manual for teachers of 92 pages and the two pamphlets, the psychotherapy and the song of prayer in addition to that. As I said earlier, it was published on June 22nd, 1976. <clears throat> It passed a million mark on sales in 1992. Uh, it's currently about 2.2, 2.3 million in sales. It now exists in 21 languages, so there's two or three more other translations that are being worked on. Uh, the order of sales, which I think is English, of course, is number one, then Spanish, uh, then German, then Chinese. <laughs> Uh, then Portuguese, and beyond that I'm not quite sure what the order is, but I just know that's the sort of the opening order of, of how it, the interest is. <clears throat> There's a, a growing interest, especially in Spanish-speaking countries. It's never been phenomenal in terms of growth. It's always been very, very slow. It's been very gradual. It's kind of just kind of grown like this, a little bit, 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 a little bit. There's no central organization behind the course. It's very important. Uh, those of us who have been working it, with it from the get-go, Ken Wapnick in particular, myself, others have said there should not be Course in Miracles churches. We think it's very important mm -hmm. that there not be Course in Miracles churches. Because the moment you have a church, you have a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. you got somebody at the top, and somebody in the middle, and somebody at the bottom, and game playing going on as to who gets to be at the top and who's going to be in the middle. So. There will never be Course in Miracles bishops and archbishops. <laughs> Cardinals. You know, we're trying to get away from all that stuff. John, you said the course is published on uh, June 22nd, 76, but you said it was published on June 22nd, 76, but yeah. there was um, a lawsuit. There yes. was um, someone got it out before? No, someone didn't get it out before. Um, there was a lawsuit. <laughs> that <clears throat> was by this Endeavor Academy in Wisconsin, um, I think it was early 92, um, saying that seeing how it was from Jesus, it wasn't something that could be copyrighted, and um, they lost the lawsuit. It's very interesting. The foundation who published the course lost it. And for a very strange kind of technological reason, um, the reason was that there were 300 copies of it that were made. I had one of them, I still got, still got it, uh, <clears throat> which were distributed, which didn't have a copyright thing on it. And there's something about if X number of copies are distributed and da 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 da. Right. So, but it doesn't really matter. It really doesn't matter anymore. Uh, it's interesting that it happened, but uh, in some ways I think it's good that it's free now. I mean, it's, it's on the internet. It's on the internet. You can download it. You can download it. Mm. Anybody can publish it, um, mm. and, and, a, and a lot of other organizations have published it. And Barnes and Noble's had a ten-dollar edition for a while that somebody published, and mm. it wasn't really quite um, because it had some commentary by the guy who. <laughs> in there, uh, which people didn't know about, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't change what it says. What it says is, is still is still the same. Did anybody get rich from it? Is that nobody got rich from it? That, that's what I thought. It's just yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, Helen, who never made anything on it, and she's the one who spent. She gave her life to it. I don't think Helen made a penny on it. I don't think the bill made any money on it. Uh, most of the money that's been made off of the original sales has gone back to the foundation which published it in order for them to fund the uh, translations. And uh, of course there was some money that was paid to the staff, but it wasn't like a phenomenal. Nobody really got rich off of it. You know, they just got a normal kind of salary. For, for working with it. Um, so, 
Text, and then there's the original edition, and then there's... Sure. This. All right, let me explain yeah. that. So when the chorus first came came through, um, the analogy that Ken Wapnick, who's really the leading spokesman for the chorus, likes to use, and it's a good analogy, is that when it first started, it came through a little rusty. By that I mean, if you go into an old house where the water hasn't been turned on for a while, and you turn the faucet on, it'll run rusty, and then it starts running clear. Well, when it first starts, it doesn't have the same kind of, after you get by chapter five or six, that's when we start finding the iambic pentameter coming up. In the early pages, there was a, quite a bit of discussion about Bill and Helen and their relationship. Uh, they really felt that there was no need to have that their relationship being discussed mm. in the book. Uh, there were things about Edgar Casey and Freud and Adler and Young and stuff like that that were in the early first few chapters. They really thought there was no need to have that to be a part of it, so that was all cut out. Uh, then when somebody found out, they actually stole a copy of the original a manuscript from the Library of Congress, or no, not the Library of Congress, the uh, Edgar Casey Foundation, I think it was, and then they they put it back. But in the meantime, they copied it, right? So you can find the text and you can, I mean, it's available as well, and you can you can read it. And but it doesn't change the message of the course. It just doesn't have the stuff about Helen and Bill and their relationship and <laughs> Edgar Casey and Freud and Young and Adler and stuff like that in it, that's all. There's no significant difference. And then there's the original edition that Well, oh, that is the original edition. Oh, no, the, the original published. The, um, oh, what's his name? I forgot his name. Uh, he was at Interfaith once. Um, well, what did he do? Yeah. Uh, he was a minister. He, he is a minister. <clears throat> there had been more than one edition. There was, yeah. there was there was, there was the Urtek, the original edition, yeah, which is what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Then Bill typed up an edition after that, which he left a lot of the stuff out of. There was an edition which was given to uh, Hugh and Casey. I think that was it. That was the Hugh and Casey yeah, edition that yeah. you're talking about. They called that the original. It's right. well, Larry, I think his name is Larry. Yeah, there's four or five, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so let's just talk briefly about what it says. Joan? No, I don't know much about Course in Miracles, I'm just mm -hmm. learning now. But from what I heard is that Marianne Williamson is very much attached to it. And um, some people, I've even heard they, people say that she wrote it, you know, and mm -hmm. obviously she didn't. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I also so can you, wrote it. <laughs> yeah, so can you elaborate on a little bit of, uh, what she has to do with this? How she got involved? Um, Marianne picked up a cup of coffee. A, picked up a cup. A cup. <laughs> <laughs> I can say this. Copy of the course off of a coffee table. <laughs> uh, actually, a coffee table of, of a guy who later became the music director at Interfaith Fellowship in New York City. Mm -hmm. And just became fascinated with this in 1978, so it was a couple years after it came out. I uh, wrote what became the, fat, the first uh, best commentary, which called Return to Love, which I know Lynn and several of you have written. Read. Read. Let me have another drink of water. <laughs> There's something in this. It's too hot in here. Oh, okay. Here then. Okay. Okay. Thank you. This is um, called burnout, right? So let's talk about what it says. Yes. <laughs> um, so as I said, the, the course of this world is very much a dream. When you dream at night, and we all do, we all have several dreams every night. Uh, actually, psychologists tell us we all have about eight dream cycles a night. And within that cycle, you may have several dreams. 
what you're doing is that you're projecting. You proje you project the dream. You make it up. Just so if you can sort of imagine, it's, it's like the back of your eyelids were screens. <laughs> Not that that's true, but because it all happens in the mind. But it's like that. So there's these images, these events, which seem to occur. And then we wake up and we think they're awake, but <laughs> according to the Course you're not awake, you just keep dreaming. But now things appear to be, that we can do things in dreams that we can't do when we're awake, we can fly in dreams. When you're awake, you've got to be inside a machine in order to fly. <laughs> but we still have a story going on. It's the story of our lives. It's the story of, and, it, and just like, you notice in most dreams there's a problem. The car won't start, you're trying to get somewhere. It's like looking at the, the Polar Express on TV that it's about a journey and there's just one little, one problem, you know, after the other. The, the train is stopped by caribou, the train is on the ice. Uh, they're, they're just kind of going through one adventure after the, the ticket gets lost and the boy goes chasing it. Well, that's just like life. You know, you wake up in the morning, and you don't. You go, "Whew, that was just a dream." But now you got to go to work, and you got to earn money, and you got to take care of your body, or maybe you got to take care of kids, and you, you got to do pay your taxes, and you just all this stuff. So nothing has really changed. You just got to. But that that distraction of the world then keeps us thinking that it's all quite real. So it keeps us dreaming the world, dreaming the story, and more than anything now, we have a television, which is telling us it's vision. Mm -hmm. And I think the silliest part of it is, it, it happened again last night, that uh, this keeps happening. My daughter was watching uh, some girls screaming at each other on television. <laughs> and one of these reality TV things, right? <laughs> Which is like very, very far away from reality. <laughs> you know? Right, this is just a, a fantasy stuff. This is just made up. This is not what the real world is. The real world is where God is, is where truth is, is where you are. Actually, this is very good news. You've actually, in terms of the Course, never left heaven. And you never left eternity, you never left, you can't. It, it'll be impossible. You can dream that you have. That's why I think what happens to us when we die, most of us, is that it's really going to be really like waking up in the morning. At which point you can turn to your friends and say, I just had the strangest life. <laughs> I live in this big city with all these people, all New York. And it's just whatever the kind of complexities are that are part of the dream that, that seems so, so very, very real and it's not. The essence of the Course is about returning our individuated, separated, segregated minds, which we see as being broken off from the wholeness of God, which causes us to feel lonely, it's painful, um, it's the place of great sadness, it's a place of great depression. To turn that mind back to the mind, so we've got little in mind and big in mind. So the task is to give our little in mind, but you have to make this decision. That's what's important about this. Not only do you have to make this decision, you have to be willing to make this decision, to give the little in mind back to the big in mind. The real basic problem, of course, is, is that we all have is the authority problem. And the authority problem just simply means whose will will rule. Mm -hmm. And what we this is the basic problem we have with children. The basic problem we have with children is whose will will rule. If if our daughter's will had ruled, 
back when she was a teenager, we would have eaten pizza for dinner every night. <laughs> she is now an adult. She eats pizza for dinner every night. <laughs> well, most nights. <laughs> we have other kinds of meals, right? <laughs> so what we've done, of course, is we've essentially said to God, and this is sort of tied into the mythology of the Adam and Eve story, thank you very much, God, I'd really rather do it myself. And God says, fine, Go, you have free will. Free will is one of the characteristics of divinity. You have free will, so you can do whatever you want to. And God does make no effort to, to stop it, cannot even stop us, because it would be going against his will. God cannot go against his own will. You've been given free will. I mean, he can't force you to do anything. Uh, there's a really nice line I was just reading this week in the Course where it says, the Holy Spirit does not command, the Holy Spirit does not demand. It simply guides. It, it provides you the right guidance, and in this sense, there's the wonderful, wonderful analogy, which I may have used when I talked about mysticism, I don't know, but it works well, is GPS. And this is exactly the way I love it when we have technology that gives us a good illustration. So if you've got a GPS system, the way it works is you punch in your intended destination, but then seconds this little black box, at the speed of light nonetheless, makes contact with four angelic beings, silver and gold beings, flying around this planet 17,000 miles per hour each. They have a little conference. They get together. One decides your latitude, one decides your longitude. One decides your altitude, and one decides your attitude. <laughs> and then they beam back to you exactly the information you need to get from wherever you are. Let's say you want to go home. There's a button on GPS systems called home. So you hit home. And now it really, within, at the speed of light, not sound, light, that thing, <laughs> foot by foot, in direction, you know, step by step. Well, according to the Course in Miracles, Lesson 49 from the workbook is, God's will, will for you is perfect happiness, but no, 49 is, God's voice speaks to me all through the day. 101 is God's will for me is perfect happiness. So, the number 49, God's voice speaks to me all through the day. You are constantly being given exactly the right direction that you need to go. Every soul, every spirit is constantly being given the, exactly the right information. And if you were to follow that information, it would take you straight home. By the Jesus in the Gospel says, straight is the way, narrow is the gate that leads into life. Few there are that go therein. Broad is the way, wide is the path that leads to where it's interesting, destruction. Many there are that go therein. Very few get this right. I mean, really get down to listening so well, so carefully, that they do. And if you really want to be happy, this is what the Course is about happiness. If you really want to be happy, the happiest you could possibly be would be to do exactly what GPS is telling you to do, what God's plan for salvation. If you did that, but we have free will. So we say, well, thank you very much, God, but I'd really rather do it myself. So then you go off and you start doing it on your own. And God doesn't stop you. In fact, as I think it's interesting, and GPS systems work the same, exactly the same way. If you're following your GPS, and you want to pull off for gas, or 
have lunch or something and you pull out of the intended destination, the very second you pull out, recalculating. <laughs> you know, so you're going along in life and you go, he's cute, I think I'll chase him for a while. <laughs> Instantaneously it goes recalculating. <laughs> Recalculate. We're gonna get you know. Here's the direction. You, you're off on a detour here. <laughs> oh my God, divorce. <laughs> good Lord, good Lord, bankruptcy. You know. I mean, you know. We're constantly giving you the right. And by the way, you notice it's very gentle. GPS systems. If you go off course, it just keeps giving. It never says, "You idiot." Yeah. Yeah. What did you do that for? I, I told you right. You went left. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> Actually, somebody told me that there is a GPS system that you can get now for your car, which will deliberately, uh, yeah, you. yeah, you know, we'll say, we'll say, <laughs> I told you right. I told you right. <laughs> it's your the mother GPS system, you know, the yeah. back driver GPS. GPS stands for God promises serenity. Actually, in terms of the Course in Miracles, it's God's plan for salvation. Mm -hmm. G P S. The lesson that preceded the one you just quoted, which you just quoted 49, 48 uh -huh. says, There is no fear. Right. And that following it, the, the, the one you just gave, is, is a, there's a perfect reason for it. If there's nothing to fear, there's no reason why you can't have perfect happiness. That's right. It all fits together just remarkably well. I'm working on a book now based on the ten characteristics of a teacher of God that's in the manual for teachers of A Course in Miracles. And those ten characteristics fall, excuse me, follow one after the other perfectly. There's a reason why one is one and the reason why two is two and three is three. Mm. And it says so mm. as, you, as you begin to go. And it's interesting why number ten is number ten. Number ten, by the way, the, the top characteristic, this fits in with interfaith of a teacher of God according to the Course is open-mindedness. And what it means by that is total open, like complete mm -hmm. open-mindedness, right? So there's no prejudice, there's no projection, there's no, no it's just because the, the mind of God is also open. And this is one thing that's really important in terms of understanding the Course. The Course, as I said, is about returning the mind back to the mind of God. But the mind of God is a, is a state of oneness. There's one mind. And so our job is to return our minds back to the one mind, which is the only place where you can be happy. And it, the sadness that we experience comes from trying to think thoughts outside of the mind of God, trying to think our own thoughts. The talk, the Course talks about what it calls your pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts, <laughs> right? And your secret thoughts and your hidden thoughts. Let me just read you. This is in, this this. There's a line. It's at the end of lesson 52 that I came across, that it only appears once in the entire Course, and it's such a beautiful line. This is a review of Lesson 10, and it says, <clears throat> uh, Would I not rather join the thinking of the universe this is the only time the phrase, the thinking of the universe, appears in the entire Course. Would I not rather join the thinking of the universe than to obscure all that is really mine with my pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts? So your pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts are your daydreams and your fantasies and your hurt feelings and all the illusions and all the, the guilt feelings and the judgments and the victimization thoughts and all that stuff that you kind of lock into yourself. What the Course is about, it, it talks about joy as one of the characteristics of a teacher of God. And 
joy of the Course is, comes in sharing. And, and the, the more that, that, that's what's exciting about love, is that love is an experience of share. We share the love. And actually the more that we, the more that we share the love, the more exciting it gets for us. So we're constantly giving it away. And then we receive in, a, in exchange for giving it away. I have a little illustration about this. Um, my wife and I had gone, well at first I had gone out to San Francisco to give some lectures about oh, five years ago. And when that was done I was going to go see Judy Scutch. We're still friends, whenever I go out there I go see her, she lives out there now. Came across the Golden Gate Bridge, there's this place where you can turn, look back up, back towards San Francisco. A lot of pictures are taken from this spot, beautiful spot, especially if it's a nice day. I take out my cell phone, call my wife, I said, honey, you should see what I'm seeing now. And she says, yeah, but I can't. <laughs> I can't even quite imagine. And, and, and so, uh, let's talk about something else. I thought, okay. So then two years ago, she goes with me to this conference, but she doesn't usually do, but she goes with me. And we make the same trip across the Golden Gate Bridge, we come back up, and actually if you've ever taken Highway 1 north out of San Francisco up along the coast, it's just, you come around these corners and you see these huge waves crashing up against these big rocks and they're just these magnificent, and the countryside too is just so pastoral. <clears throat> And as we're coming around these bends, and she, she was always like, Oh, honey, look! <laughs> oh, oh, honey, look! look! And I, it just brought such joy to my heart to hear my wife saying, Oh, honey, look! I mean, there's like... It's a joining. Joining, it's sharing, you know, I mean, divine abstraction, one point, divine abstraction is about as close as it comes to the finding God in the courses. Divine abstraction takes joy in sharing. It's the only instant. Mark Twain once said, sorrow can take care of itself, but joy is something which must be shared. So what's the first thing, you, if you get good news, what's the first thing, some, some really, you got to share it, you got to get on the phone, right? You got to, hey, you know, the baby was born, or the check came in, or the contract went through, or the, you got to share that information, yeah. right? Well, that's joy comes in sharing, which is just the opposite of withholding and with, with contracting. And the course is that depression is the is the opposite of inspiration. So inspiration is where we're receiving in guidance, you know, we're in spirit, right? And depression is where we're, there's just no inspiration at all. You know, we're, we're caught up in our own story, we're caught up in our own mm -hmm. dream life, and that's all that's going on is just thinking about how, how miserable I am, really because I've locked myself into this cell of, of, of aloneness in my own mind. So again, the exciting thing is that it works, but you got to do it. it. It's a discipline. And, and the Course says, you are much too tolerant of mind wandering. You passively condone your mind's miscreations, the fantasies, the dreams. It's only human. Sorry? Pardon? You say it's only human. I'm only human. No, it's only human, yeah. <laughs> right. But we could change all that. You could, you, could, you could do exactly what God is asking you to do. And, and that's one of the reasons you're here, by the way, I mean, uh, that you're here as an interfaith as a part of the program, is that you're trying to hear, and you're trying to respond on a deeper spiritual level, to, to do something that you feel called to do, which is not just some mundane thing, but it's, it involves some sharing, some contribution, some giving of yourself in love, in some sort of deeper way, with, uh, with the others that we share this world with. 
I think it's interesting. People think that if you think for just a moment about the people who we regarded as the ones who made the biggest contributions to this world, they're really all people who were willing to pay attention to the call to really respond deeply and to do what God was asking. If you think about the Elbridge Schweitzers and the uh, Helen Kellers and the Mahatma Gandhis and the Jesuses and the Buddhas and the Dalai Lamas, you know, they, it wasn't that they made money or built buildings or, you know, they were willing to be selfless and in the process of being selfless, we're part of the self. It's, it's being part of the larger <coughs> self that is the greatest joy that we can possibly know. That's why you should, there should be no fear in dying. <laughs> this is a very important statement before people are going to do funeral services. <laughs> there should be no fear in dying. Funeral service, let me say something about since she brought up here. Just, Funeral services are wonderful. You're in a situation where people are sitting listening to you, they're raw, they're open, they're ready to hear, and we've pretty well got it set up that you can, unless you're just out, totally outrageous, you can say pretty much whatever you want to. And you can say something really meaningful, and people want it, are ready to hear that the real, they're not there because of the deceased. <laughs> I mean, they are there because of the deceased, but they're really there thinking about their own death. <laughs> they're thinking about their own mortality. So we're seeing how we're thinking about our own mortality, and then we're thinking about what it means to be giving over to the eternal, as opposed to that which is confined. And that's why the Course says that the body is, it actually uses the word prison at one point to describe the body. Not that the body is a prison, but the body is in terms of the Course, the body is a learning device. That's one of the major definitions for the body. It's a learning device. So is time. It also speaks that time is a learning device. So what you want to do is you want to learn how to use this body in this time to, to learn as much as you can about the eternal, about what's really going on, rather than to continue to be caught up in some sort of dreaming of the world and the illusion of money or personality or fame or all the stuff that it's easy to get caught up in the world. So think of pleasures, thinking that it's real. St. Francis, we already talked about St. Francis earlier. Frank, he, I no doubt that he was pretty close to being enlightened, but he had a few strange quirks. Uh, one of them was that he hated the body. He thought the body, he, it's sort of, and a lot of the mystics have this happen. They realize that they're not bodies, but rather than utilizing the bodies, they, they put it down. So poor St. Francis, <laughs> sprinkled ashes on his food before he would eat his food. You know, isn't that awful, sprinkling ashes? Yeah. Yeah. To kill the taste? You know, like this is a misunderstanding of the whole, you know, we're not... Very judgmental of him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're judgmental of me, I suppose, but... You know, as long as you got it, you know. It, well, maybe it helped him be less attached to the desires of the body. You know? Well, I suppose it did. If he allowed himself to be enticed by food, he might be enticed by sex or something else. Too. Well, I love that, Larry. You're a well, neurologist in St. Francis. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of his, the, the, Henri Seuss, who was uh, actually a German mystic, but, but came after him in terms of time, wore hair shirts and stood out in the cold and rubbed salt into his wounds. And, I mean, all of it as a means of trying to put down the body. Mm -hmm. it, but that makes the body real. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's going in, it's going, it's just the same as getting caught up in 
empty. A bodily addiction of some sort. Yeah, these are the people who say, I and the body are one. <laughs> I and the body are one. They're <laughs> 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 just getting warmed up. This is a hot conversation. <laughs> Speaks so, my language. <laughs> are there questions about the course? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, when Helen received this information and she began to write, I guess, you know, this went on for many years, right? Before seven she, years. Okay, seven years. Once she stopped writing, did she take that material and begin to edit it? Was that edited? No. Or was Helen, this just the way it came? Well, it was edited in the sense that when they produced the first edition, mm -hmm. which was came, this is, pr they did go back through and they did cut out the stuff about Helen and their relationship. They went through and they cut out the stuff about Freud. I mean, not that, but I mean, like each no, chapter, no. like you would edit, no. you're writing a book. So no, you because go back it, it, you, came, you know. it came through purely. Grammatically? Pardon? Grammatically? Now, Helen was a stickler for grammar, and she was always looking to catch Jesus. We, we, we think Jesus is the author, right? And because uh, if, she, if she could catch him in a grammatical error, then she would think it, was, it wasn't real. I mean, she wanted to find this wasn't real either, you know? But rather than finding that, it just kept proving itself more and more and more real all the time. It wasn't. It, it, How did she know when it was ended, when it was over? At one point, uh, the voice said to her that um, you will know when it ends when I say, and now we say amen. Mm -hmm. And the last line of the chorus is, and now we say amen. And so it was ended. Did no. she find it embarrassing? What? No, I don't think she found it embarrassing. One of the things that I always really admired about Helen um, was the way she kept herself out of the limelight when it came to the chorus. She wouldn't appear in, like, on television or she wouldn't go on to radio shows or uh, appear in public. She would appear in small, she would come to small groups and talk about the chorus. But Helen Ego did get involved in this. Well, let me explain how. The first conference that was ever held on the chorus was held at the Barbizon Plaza here in New York City. Mm -hmm. I remember the day, May 13th, 1978. So it was published on June 22nd, 76. So this is just one month shy of two years after it was released, right? And, and I was there, of course Ken was there, and Judy was there, and Jerry Jampolsky was there, and a uh, you know, number of, of the primary speakers on the course were there. Helen was not there, and Bill was there, but Helen wasn't. The reason why Helen wasn't there, there was more than one reason. One, um, there was somebody who will remain nameless, it doesn't matter, it's being recorded, um, who had put himself up as a teacher of the course. This, this person has since passed. He died about five years after Helen did. Um, but it was clear to Helen that he didn't understand the course. And he was kind of mixing New Age stuff in with the course. And it really bothered her that, that he was doing this. And there was just no way in the world that she was going to be able to sit there and listen to this guy abuse her baby. I mean, this was her baby. I mean, she never had children. This was, she gave birth to this thing, right? And there was a couple other reasons she wasn't there. One was there were enough of us that knew who she was that we would no doubt have approached her. Other people would have seen, her, would have seen us approaching her and would have gathered around. She did not want people gathering around her. That would have not, she wouldn't have liked to have people gathering around her. That wasn't something that would work for her. It's interesting, her last words to Judy Scotch before she died was, <clears throat> you know why I'm going, don't you, Kit? She always called Judy Kit. She had these very kind of nice terms. Um, she said, I got to get out of its way. She died on February the 9th, 1981. And by that time, the course was becoming well enough known 
that um, she just wanted to get out of the way of it. She didn't want to have her ego involved in, in seeing people like misinterpreting and things like that. So she was ready to go. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you about editing. Didn't Ken Martin edit it? He, um, well, when it was done, Ken and Helen together went back through it. Ken, not, not Ken by himself, but Ken and Helen together. They literally went sentence by sentence and said, is this what you, is this what you want? Is this what you want? And that was the that was the editing that was done. And I said most all that occurs in the first four or five chapters. By chapter six, we, we, it's just straight. There's no editing done at all. Very very little, tiny little things here and there. There was I know the guy who set the type on this, the first edition, and it was set on an old very type of uh, Compset five ten two, which didn't have a memory in it. Uh, so there were, yeah, that's inevitable, you got scribal errors, words were dropped or, and so they had, that's why the 192 edition, 1992 edition, they went back and cleaned up those little places where, but those were just scribal errors, they weren't anything that really affected the content of the course at all. And there weren't any chapters though, Ty. No, there were no chapters, and that's what they did when they did, Sorry. Well, that, they did do that when they went back through, and, and Ken and Helen did, make the chapter, the breaks, and the headings and decisions, yes, that was done. Right. Yeah. Um, I know it's kind of obscure, but uh, we, we've talked a little bit before about the um, pamphlet, the purpose and practice of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. It's meant a lot to me personally, and I yeah. work with people, I've used it, it's helped me. Why is it not included in the course? Do you know why is it, why is it, um, you know, why is it separate? Was it separate track? What was the purpose of writing it? Why did she write it? As an addendum, you mean? As an addendum, yes. That's a good way. Um, already after the course came out, people were misinterpreting the course, and, and it was partly meant as a helpful tool and clarifying, clarifying uh, along with the Song of Prayer as well. The Song of Prayer was also to help to kind of clarify, especially what we mean by the word forgiveness. That was really important. And what we meant by the word prayer, that was really important as well. But also just the, the whole purpose of the, the clarification that comes in the psychotherapy pamphlet is what the purpose of psychotherapy is, for example. Right? And her motive for writing it was to clarify what was already in the course? Right. And, but it was right. after Amen. It was after Amen, okay. yes, because Amen meant the text had been finished. Okay. Right. She had this thought it was yes. over before that. Pardon? I heard she thought it was over before that. So she went, but then more came. Oh. Well, well they didn't actually. Go well, when, <laughs> when the text was done, they thought it was done. Mm. And she, she didn't know there was going to be a workbook. And then all of a sudden the workbook started coming. And that was, that took a long time too. Of course. Frankly, I, I think the Course really is the most important spiritual document which has ever crossed the face of planet Earth. There's, there is literally nothing like it. Not, there's just nothing like it. I mean, if you think, and I think someday it will be regarded as scripture. I personally think of it that way already. I know that a number of people do. Um, it's not to say it's the last word. There could be something that that comes after the Course does. I mean, a hundred years from now. I, in fact, is it's interesting that there is this hundred year sequence thing that's sort of strange about the Course. The Course was copyrighted in 1975, published in 1976, right? Well, Mary Baker Eddy's uh, uh, Spirituality and Health 
was copyrighted in 19, 1875 and published in 1876. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another century from And actually, if you think about 100 years prior to that, mm -hmm. it, was nine, it was 1776, and there was kind of an important free, yeah. free, wow. freeing document that occurred at that point, you know, mm -hmm. and who knows what 2076 could bring, not that it has to, you know, but it just... We can speculate. We, we can speculate, yes, <laughs> that that's a possibility. This is probably included in the book, because I've just started looking through it. Does the voice ever identify itself? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no clear identification in the beginning, but already by the time you get to the end of chapter one, you find lines like, I never said I have come not to bring peace but a sword. Now, who said, I, have never, I did not come to bring peace but a sword? Jesus. Jesus. I mean, it's, it's in the Gospel. So it's, it's obviously Jesus, right? So it, it is, it's the voice of Jesus. But now here's a really important question, you know. The Chorus talks a lot about, the, the word Jesus doesn't appear in the Chorus except in the Mandate for Teachers. And it appears 13 times in the Mandate for Teachers in the clarification of term section just as a definition of who Jesus was. Um, the Course talks about the Holy Spirit, it talks about God, it talks about Jesus. At another point it talks about the Son of God being Jesus, but also being you and me and everyone. That, and, but it, it says there's no place at which the Son begins the Son ends and the Father begins. If you get right down to understanding the mythology of the Course, and there's a mythology to the Course, it's just like there's a mythology of them, but the mythology, just in terms of understanding, it comes to us in words. You know, and it says in the beginning, you know, words are symbols of symbols, twice removed from reality. God doesn't think in words. Words are English or German or something that we've, we've made up. I mean, it's so beyond that kind of thought processes. There really is no such thing as the Holy Spirit. Uh, there really is no such thing as Jesus. There really is no such thing as God. In the sense that there is just this one voice, and you can call it God if you will. In fact, it's, I'm going to wrap up so that we can do some closing stuff. we got to be out of here by 4.30. Um, Helen had a vision. Let me just tell you about this vision she had that was very interesting. There's a fine line between dreams and visions, by the way, and she was very subject to visionary experiences. She saw herself on the side of the, like an ocean, on the side of a cliff, in the water, and a cave. And she goes into this cave, and in the cave, there is an, an, a scroll, an old scroll that's laying like on an altar of a scroll. And she begins to, to turn it to the left. And as she turns, there's these little like symbols or words or squiggles. And, but the more she turns it, just like in a dream, the more it begins to become clear. And she realizes that she's going to be able to read this and see what it says. And, and she knows it's about the past. And she begins to turn it a little bit to the right, and she sees again the squiggles, and the, she realizes that this is about the future, and she's going to be able to look into the future. But before she looks into the, she turns it right back to the middle, and the, in the middle is just the word "God is." That's all it says. It's just as "God is." When she turns it back, this voice says, "Thank you. You got it right this time." Mm -hmm. It's just God is. You know, it's not about the past, it's not about the future, it's just about God, it's just about the present. And that's the mystical experience, it's just about the present moment. There is only an ego. The ego lives in the past. Or it, it projects a future, and guilt is in the past, fear is in the future. And it's not about guilt, and it's not about fear, it's just about the present. So, if you want to know who wrote this, I'll tell you who wrote it. You wrote it. 
you wrote it in the sense of the very your mind, the the mind which is a part of the mind of God wrote it. Your very best mind wrote it. The truth that's in you wrote it. The truth that's in every mind wrote it. You know, it's it's a collective. God wrote it. <laughs> it's not that Jesus that it, we think of Jesus as a person, and we think of even of the Holy Spirit. We, we call the Holy Spirit He. Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't have sex. That doesn't sound right. But <laughs> it doesn't have. So there's no sex. There's no. There's no division. <laughs> no, there's no gender. There's no gender, that's good, yes, there's yeah. no gender. Let's stop it. Right. So in other words, I just wanted to say, that according to what you just said, it's very interesting what you just said. Of course, in Miracles, the next line is, just reminiscences. Just reminiscences? Yes. Because if I wrote it, I, and I did. Yes, I um, thought you had. Yes, right. <laughs> I didn't know I'd take full credit. <laughs> along with everybody else. <laughs> the co-authors go by the gazillions. <laughs> so, um, you know, this reminiscence is, is exactly what we're doing. We're remembering yes. what, that's why I'm saying yeah. reminiscences, okay? Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the whole thing is about, I have a talk that I do that's called uh, Everybody Already Knows, which is based upon a line in the Course where it says everybody already knows. So everybody already knows the truth. So seeing everybody already knows the truth, it's just a matter of helping us to remember, reminisces, what you already know. You already know this, but we've got it all covered over with societal stuff and illusion, the dreaming of the world. Of course, the main phrase it uses, the dreaming of the world. We, we're dreaming the dream of the world, which is both a collective and individual <coughs> dream. Anyhow, I'll turn it back to Kathleen for the last 10 minutes. Well, thank you, John. It was interesting yeah. and Good. informative. And <laughs> let's give it a hand. Yes. Thank you for that gift. This is a gift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, next month we will be studying Baha'i, or this month you'll be studying Baha'i. And you know that there is not a chapter on Baha'i in the Houston Smith book. We have sent you an MP3 of a section on Baha'i that was recorded last semester, last semester. In the video from 2000. Okay, so, and you have the video, so that should be enough material. Um, <clears throat> if you can, you know, visit a Baha'i center, that would be great. We will have a speaker in January on Baha'i, and we'll also have. Um, Maureen, who will talk about wedding ceremonies, and um, we will talk a little bit about funeral development. Okay? So let's stand up and moving closely, and we'll sing the Hallelujah song, which you will be singing at ordination. Okay. Do you want to do this cross arm? Sure. Your cross arm. Yeah. Right over left. Right over left. Right left over right. Oh, right. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, let us praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, let us praise the Lord. The next group that's coming in is, is a dance class, so we need to put the <laughs> chairs, put the chairs back and say goodbyes outside. Right.